Right, so um, why are we doing this session? Because um, this is all about what really works in artificial intelligence. Um, and we've seen a lot of companies that are applying machine learning. Sometimes they're about to apply machine learning. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of uh, talks uh, around what could AI do in the future. But uh, as investors, we care about what's really working. As an incubator, uh, you care about what's really working. So that's why uh, we wanted to do this little session. We prepared some questions, but actually this is your chance. If you're thinking about what you want to do in machine learning, in your company, in your startup, maybe even as a job, uh, ask us anything and we hopefully can answer it. Um, just, uh, so I would like to ask uh, you to introduce yourself, but just very roughly because there are certain things that maybe you don't want to say yourself. So Ben uh, on, the, on the left side is from Atomico. I think you're managing 850 million. I always get that Maybe wrong. Maybe a little bit more, 1.2, uh, 1.3 1 million. All right, million. so much more money than we do. <laughs> Huge fund, uh, one of the founders is the founder of Skype. Um, yep. Do a lot of very, very big technology bets, can invest a lot of money in those companies, mm -hmm. which is pretty impressive. Um, we like to partner with them a lot, and they invest all across Europe, but also outside. Um, and Ben has a background in computer science um, yep. and has invested in quite some nice artificial intelligence companies. After that, please tell us a little bit more about your motivation and what you're doing. <laughs> and Rasmus uh, also has a, oh, by the way, and you have a, I think, uh, computer science in, uh, from Cambridge, yes. your degree. And then uh, on this side, there is a, a rowing, I think, uh, opponent from Oxford. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you guys did with the rowing challenge, but uh, Rasmus uh, from Oxford with mechanical engineering, and then I think from Zurich with computer science PhD, who is the head of Merantix, a, um, a company that is starting AI uh, or machine learning enabled business models. So various ones by attracting very, very good talent and helping them to start companies. Um, so very glad to have you both here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ben, tell us why, what you like about machine learning, artificial intelligence, why you're here, and what's your background? Sure, I think you, you gave a great overview of, of Atomico, but I think we're a, we're a venture fund based in London, and we, we're a generalist fund, so we look at a lot of kinds of businesses, but I think we're one of the few funds in Europe, alongside Holzbrink, um, who are kind of committing a significant amount of capital to, to invest in, in companies who are really building with new and emerging technologies. Um, and that's kind of what's kept me excited. I, I got into venture from a kind of computer science and engineering background with a, a view to really wanting to help support companies who are really kind of innovating at the cutting edge. And, and so at Atomico, we kind of look at two groups of companies. One are, are kind of, um, I would say, like applied AI and analytics companies. So companies that are taking um, advances in technologies that have come about over the last two or three years and, and really applying them to specific commercial problems. And that's where I focus most of my time. We also look at some more kind of frontier technology investments that are often using AI machine learning as part of things like computer vision um, or, or in things like um, healthcare use cases like drug discovery and, and, and other areas like that. So that team also kind of invests some of the, the kind of most capital intensive um, bets that we've made, but on, on things like um, uh, we invested in a business uh, developing a new semiconductor for AI workloads called GraphCore. And those kind of businesses, kind of really the, the building blocks of AI are, are kind of, uh, it's great to see those coming from Europe, but those need kind of real investment behind them as well. So another kind of business, and, uh, but, but still very much an, an AI business. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're about and, and kind of why, I, why I'm kind of investing in this area. Great. So, Rasmus, tell us why incubation makes sense in the space of AI. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I was actually in academic research before, and there were like a ton of really nice spin-offs um, at, at ETH, but many of them had like great technology and great teams and were working on really big problems, but like commercializing them properly like was quite difficult for many of them, just because the team setup wasn't right, uh, because they didn't have access to the right industry partners, maybe didn't have the right investors on board, and that was actually quite sad to see. I mean, many of them got acquired by like Google and Apple and Qualcomm, the large companies, but like quite early onwards, and so uh, there could have been much more potential if they would have been in the right environment, and that's basically what Mirantix is about. So it's a, it's a venture studio um, focused on um, incubating AI companies for one, two, three years. We're very flexible on how long we incubate the companies. We can fund them with up to a few million in euros, so there's, there's you know, like a significant amount of capital behind them, really bring them to a strong Series A. And um, basically during this process, I mean, 
Merantix not only provides capital, but it's obviously also very great to, to tra attract talent in different areas and also builds kind of the network to industry partners. And I think one reason right now we have, a, you know, Jonas is building the healthcare, MX Healthcare. We have a company in the autonomous driving space working um, basically in the validation testing space of autonomous cars and handling basically the raw amounts of data coming from the cars. Um, we have a few smaller companies, which are you know, just a few people. And I think one special thing about Neurantic is that we run MX Labs, which is, which is also here today, uh, which runs actually also projects with industry partners. So um, one way we, we actually get involved in, into new ventures, um, potentially also with co corporate partners. So for example, in healthcare, um, with like, you know, like a dozen hospital partners across Europe or an automotive with some large car companies, is that we basically um, run projects with labs and collaborate with them and build a partnership um, to then later incubate a company in, in that field, potentially with, with a corporate together. And I think that's, that's really important because like, obviously like we can, uh, for a lot of the consumer stuff, you can, you can basically just develop that um, at home and like put in the app store and see what sticks and then iterate. But like for, for some of this stuff, like, like healthcare um, or automotive, like any or industry, anything where, where, you, where you go in these like, you know, like quite complex industries, you need to get out, you need to work with those companies. And so um, in order to get a great product market fit, because yeah, it's, it's quite easy with a great team to, to raise some money to, uh, for a great team in the beginning. But at some point uh, you will have to show traction and great product market fit. And um, I think that's, that's very important, and so that's what we really focus on with Merantix. And maybe one last thing, so actually all our companies are uh, incubated in different industries, which sometimes sounds a bit counterintuitive, but actually has the huge advantage that they will never compete with each other because they all sell to completely different clients. And so internally, actually, we can share basically all the knowledge, all the, you know, all, both, even code, which is, was just developed jointly. Um, to basically make everybody more productive. And so Mirantix has very little overhead. It's just, Mirantix itself is just four people. It's my co-founder, Adrian, and me, and then uh, two more in the, in the core team. Mm -hmm. um, and everything else happens in the companies and them basically helping each other. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we are. We are in Berlin, two, uh, two and a half years old. And um, obviously, are right now also looking at new industries we want to get into. And so that's why it's, very, it's a very like, ongoing thing to think about business models where AI can be really used, how is the technology ready, is the market ready, is it large enough um, for our existing companies, but also new companies we're going to work on. Great. Maybe one, one other thought, and I think it's, it's one of the, the most exciting things when you look at, at the last 10 years, and this, this is not my own point, but I've, I've stolen it from somebody much smarter than me in the US, but if you look at the last 10 years and the kind of companies that were built on problems that were sold, they were a lot of the easier problems. They were, how do I get food to myself quicker? Or how do I get from A to B on, in a taxi faster? And I think a lot of the, the problems that, that you're tackling now and the problems that, that great companies are, are tackling now are the much harder ones. They're in healthcare, they're in manufacturing. They're in these other much more complex areas, but the, the opportunity to solve those problems or the, the, the improvements that can be made if we do solve them are, are kind of much more significant. And so I think they're also problems that are are kind of naturally problems really well suited to being solved by, by machine learning and AI and its various applications. And, and so I think that it's, uh, and also to be solved in, in Europe where a lot of, uh, we have a lot of kind of historic strength in, in these industries. And I think that those things come together to be a kind of very exciting time over the next 10 years in, in these areas. Uh, and maybe adding to what you just said and then to give you a little background about myself and wh what we do, uh, how we do our investment. We come from a consumer internet background. So Zalando, we were first investor. Flixbus, we were first, in first investor. So for us, actually, this research projects, we don't really like them. Uh, we want to see a product that you can uh, give to a customer and get instant feedback like I2X or Ultimate AI, where we invested in. Um, and with machine learning sometimes, and we saw that with, with a company called Zeitgold, where we deployed a lot of money uh, to accounting automation, it's sometimes takes quite some time until you get the automation done. So it's actually a learning process for us as an investor as well that uh, it's great what happens in machine learning, but you should actually take a bit more risk around, let's say you bet on the team, but that the application might fail at the beginning as long as there will be a product at some time. Mm. Um, and maybe looking uh, to start off, and then it's, it's your stage, but uh, looking into the future, um, is your feeling that we are still in this kind of experimental phase where people are applying neural networks, maybe reinforcement learning, maybe even genetic algorithms whatsoever, and just testing them around hypothesis what could be a product, or are we a, a step ahead of that? I think we have like different kind of streams. So I think now there are definitely the first couple of companies who are actually really using this stuff and scaling that and actually showing that it's, it's a real company. Mm -hmm. um, 
as opposed to like a few years ago when like most of these companies were like very researchy, more like acqui hires or tech tech ac hires at the end. Um, but at the same time, you also now have super researchy like frontier companies who are working on on some of the more advanced machine learning, which is still not really working fully or still like application maybe a bit unclear, but which probably will go to this production stage in a few years. So I think it's like from the time when it works in research to the time when it's um, really in in a product. It takes some time because uh, you know it needs to get robust. People need to understand it, and I think this time will shorten. But um, there, there's always going to be like parallel things happening. I think. Yeah, and I think there are there are some kinds of AI machine learning um, areas that are, are well developed now. So if you need if you want to build something that's based on speech recognition, there are mature libraries and approaches that you can use to to do that and build great applied products using those technologies. I think there are other areas, some of the things around kind of massive scale simulation or something like this, where the approaches are still kind of being worked on and are, are kind of more research led. And so I think companies that are trying to apply those are kind of naturally solving two problems at once, both how do we crack the underlying technical approach and how do we do the commercialization. And so I think when, when you look at those companies, uh, from an investor perspective, the opportunities are often big because they are solving a new problem that they can only solve because of the technology approach they've taken. But then you've got to have this kind of two different buckets of risk. There's the technical risk and there's the commercialization risk and kind of two types of team. You have to have a kind of bigger technical and research team and, and again, the kind of commercialization side of the business. So they're, they're often the kind of more intensive businesses to build, but again, kind of a big reward if you, if you can get all the pieces together. I think there's also another thing, like even for, like I think medical imaging is actually a great example. Like, you know, like medical imaging in, in, in deep learning has been around for many years and like now training an algorithm on some public medical data set takes you like, you can probably build that in a day and we'll have yeah. a demo working. Now getting a medical grade product out there where you have a lot of considerations, okay, how you know, do you handle hundreds of terabytes of medical data? What do you annotate? If you would annotate everything, you would burn 50 million. I mean, I would be happy to do that, but it's like, it's not, it's not very smart, and I think our investors wouldn't like it. So being smart about, for example, what you annotate, how you annotate, also annotation, so like the, basically the, 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 how you prepare the data works very differently for like a medical product as opposed to for like research, because research, these standard data sets are more about comparing each other on like some standard benchmark risk, and, 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 and now, in like a medical product, you need to annotate much more because you need to actually also predict much more about, about the image. And so there is a lot of these things also, um, for example, also dealing with uncertainty. So if our algorithm predicts something and there's obviously some uncertainty involved, how can you quantify that? These are like all very hard machine learning problems, but very applied and kind of getting basically these 80%, like some algorithm to work takes a day, building a medical grade product takes like 20 man years of work. So mm -hmm. um, it's uh, like, and I think many people underestimate that also because like academia has less of a focus on, um, often on, on this part. Um, and sometimes not even the same challenges because they might deal with smaller data sets. And so the challenges are just different. Cool. So now it's up to you. I see a first question over there. We have a microphone. There are those throwing microphones. Maybe we should introduce them here. Ah, it's, uh, it's the guy with the hat. Oh, you just shout. Hi. So uh, my name is Tommy. I'm a science journalist based here in Berlin. And my question is a rather broad one. So um, what do, could you name or single out a couple of business branches that you think will be where, where the impact of AI will be most disruptive and can you think of any well-established laws and practices that will have to be revised or even rewritten in, in the course of establishing, bringing AI into it? Sure, I, I mean, like, I'm a bit biased, but I think healthcare is gonna be big. Um, just because it's like generally a space where there is already a lot of data and you could actually collect much more data and quantify it. And like, I think if, if it would be, healthcare would be more data driven, like it would be better for everyone in here and also anywhere in the world. So I think it's just a very obvious application. At the same time, there are a lot of challenges around product, what Jonas talked about a lot, about regulatory. And there, I mean, yeah, you have some, some regulatory, regulatory topics Jonas has also been talking about. So I think for that specific thing, um, I think he has a few things he would like to change in, in the law. Um, um, also, mobility, autonomous driving, I mean, you have similar applications, right? Like, who's liable when something goes wrong? Um, how, how, do you need these, how do you certify these systems? So often, I mean, neural networks are kind of black boxes, 
I mean, they're, they're very large. I mean, they're, you know, have a lot of parameters. Obviously, people work on, on making them more explainable, but in the end, you still have a, if you, if you solve a hard problem, you wouldn't have a big neural network uh, trying to solve it because the problem is so hard. And so then it's very, it's, it's very optimistic to then think you can basically explain it with a simple rule. So it's going to be hard to explain. And so then it's always about like liability. So if this black box does something wrong or is biased, like who, who's liable for it? Is this allowed? How you test this properly? And so I think around these topics, there's a lot, lot to discuss. Generally, large industries, to wrap this up, healthcare, automotive, I think anything in, in, in manufacturing, robotics, like there, there's some big applications. Anything around like back office automation, huge. Um, I think like one space we, we're also interested in is cyber security. So um, that, that is becoming like a bigger, bigger and bigger problem and obviously a lot of data there. Um, so yeah, I think basically in every, any industry you can, you can pick topics and some are even, <laughs> I guess, like kind of cross vertical. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree, and I think that, that touches a lot of areas. I think one other perspective on the question, which I think is, is interesting here, is dealing with uh, personal data. And, and obviously, there's a set of rules around what you can and can't do with, with personal data, but I think there's also a, a societal change that maybe needs to come, or, or kind of not necessarily rules, but people's um, willingness to share, or kind of, um, I guess, in the, in the end, people giving in to, to companies having and, and kind of using these technologies on, on their own data. And I think that um, whether that's something kind of trivial like retargeting of advertising based on kind of knowing more and more about you through to something less trivial like a, a credit decision made on, on your financial history, something even less trivial like a, a kind of uh, a healthcare provision decision based on, on your genetics, like... Those things are, are kind of different steps with different regulatory burdens around them. But I think that I think over time, um, the optimist's view says that we all, in the end, that all the technology is built for the best, and in the end, we all give in and go, well, it's going to make the best decisions in the end, but uh, and, and so we're going to trust it. I think there's a lot of things that have to happen for for most. I mean, maybe for people in this room, we're probably kind of further along in, in kind of the, the trust we have, and, and that comes, I think, from understanding. But I think that there's probably a long way to go before the, the general population are kind of happy to to buy into um, those decisions based on that personal data being made in that way. Yeah. Adding to your points, uh, what we see is wh wherever you have certain set of rules uh, that you, for example, can, can match the algorithms to, so the algorithm knows, okay, whatever I detect, it should match the set of rules of formalization. That works nicely. Accounting is a space where there's a lot of manual labor still. Uh, back office automation you mentioned. Um, what we also see in legal, um, Leverton uh, was active there, so data extraction from documents, but then matching that data to actually the legal system. Um, there will be things happening, um, but the big question is, do you have a set of rules that you can, I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, that's statistics behind it. Um, there is huge potential, and uh, I think especially Michael from I2X highlighted that, uh, also Retu from Ultimate AI. People sometimes don't want to do this kind of work. They're happy if you take it away from them, and then they can actually invest more time in other things. So we think that the adoption in those spaces where, the, where there's a lot of repetitive, boring work will be very, very high. Because it's not just about uh, the CFO saying, oh, this is amazing, I can automate everything so I can save costs, but it's also about the people using it because, as you said, annotating the data, getting the feedback loops, that's pretty important. You can't just put it, plug it in like a software and then it works instantly. This one here. Um, to save Rasmus from the potential subjective bias, maybe this is more for, for Jasper and Ben, but... If you look at the US or, or uh, Asia, especially China, what they're doing in AI, I mean, it's a, it's a big world. Um, you feel humbled sometimes in Europe looking at the companies here. I mean, yes, there have been a lot of success stories. I mean, US investors have been very successful identifying those local stories. But maybe apart from, um, well, barriers to, barriers to entry, language, regulatory framework, all of that, what motivates you being in the European well, venture space or AI sector, what, what kind of, what is our competitive edge or, or how do you motivate young people to join that and not run off to the US or, or, or Asia? I mean, what, what keeps you in Europe? So I had a discussion yesterday with a member of parliament, a German member of parliament, and, um, and we really see, at least in our companies, and that's not thousands of companies, but we have invested in five AI-driven companies, that first of all, we have pretty good talent here that is willing to work in a startup at 
okayish salary levels. And I'm not saying they're underpaid, I think they get good salaries, but if you look at uh, the Silicon Valley, uh, where just a, a project leader at Google gets maybe a million or two, if they are on a certain topic and have a neuroscience degree from Cornell or I don't know, uh, that's an issue, right? So you basically need more money, and then you don't know what will happen, so more risk. Um, the second one is people like to come to, to Germany and work here. So we get a lot of talent uh, from Eastern Europe, also Western Europe. Uh, they migrate here and come to the startups. It's also the other way around, so they're moving around, obviously, but that's a positive thing about Europe. Um, and there is pretty good education around it, and then uh, German universities have very good talent. Um, and I think we have certain data versus the Chinese. I mean, we learned it from Konux and, and, and Ronnie from, um, um, from Micropsy that uh, the Chinese don't have uh, around production, maybe even the railway system. Our accounting system is quite special. Um, healthcare, we have certain data. I, I, this, is, this is a rumor, but I heard that a certain huge uh, US company trained their uh, named by, I think, um, I think a scientist uh, algorithm on, on training data from Boston. So rich, white people from Boston, Massachusetts, and then it wasn't working in Germany anymore. Um, so so that, that's definitely an advantage. But language barrier is also one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, th there's two points. I think the talent in Europe is, is very strong, and there are, there are lots of statistics that show that we have more, across Europe, we have more developers than in the US. Um, I, I think that uh, as you say, the kind of the, the deeply technical talent, particularly the, the depth of that talent in, in Eastern Europe as well, I think is is kind of uh, a great kind of potential source for building these companies. I think that I mean, there's other things like I, some of the most innovative global uh, deep learning companies, DeepMind as, a, as an example, were were European companies to start with. So we're not kind of I don't think we're on the back foot there. I think that we we still are coming from a, a place of strength. And then I think for me, the, the thing that's most exciting, and I, I think I touched on this before, is that when we look at, I think basically the same thing, when we look at applying these technologies, even if we're, we're not going to be building um, face recognition companies that are as valuable as the multi-billion dollar companies in China, when you look at applying these technologies to manufacturing, to healthcare, to areas where Europe has had historic strength, to financial services, I think we're in a great position to combine the, the kind of great technical talent from our universities with people who have had careers in industry building, um, building corporates or working in corporates and now more and more are ready to come out of those corporate jobs and to start disruptive companies kind of solving problems that, they, that they've spent their careers dealing with. I think that's another thing that really gives us a, a strength. And Rasmus, I guess you could build your lab, your studio anywhere in the world. Yeah, we moved here also on purpose, so we were also thinking to, to go to other places, but like we also moved it here on purpose for talent and also for mm -hmm. kind of proximity to certain industries which are interesting for, for machine learning applications. So, next question. There's one in the back. Hi, uh, Andreas from uh, Speed Invest. Um, I'm uh, wondering, um, so there are certain areas where you don't have enough data, right? And there are certain areas where you have uh, enough data, um, but the data quality is, is, is lacking behind. Uh, so how do you see the whole, uh, like the whole issue of like uh, data preparation and data quality and, and, and data cleaning? Um, and how it hinders uh, like uh, scalable business models and drives it more towards a, a project-based uh, business. I would be interested in that. Sounds yeah. like the question for you. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think you need to think about um, one, like standardization of the use case. So like, yeah, especially in like some of the manufacturing use cases, like each, each factory looks differently, very simply put. So um, that there that can be challenging. For example, like in healthcare mammography, like it's it's pretty standardized globally, like more or less. So um, it's certainly easy in those industries where, where some of the the way the image is taken is, is standardized because of some law um, or other data. Um, if it's not the case, which is also fine, I think you need to in order to not do too much project-based business, you need to build it in a kind of self-service way. So in the end, if you think about I don't know manufacturing quality control. Um, you don't want to send three engineers to, to every factory and spend like three months there to, to, to get the system ready. Um, unless the contract is like 10 million, then you know, it's probably fine. But otherwise, you want to do it self-service so that somebody who doesn't have the technical expertise can basically just with a user interface like um, basically configure the system. And so um, that, that is kind of, I think, how you need to think about the product. And in, in general, like, yeah, you need, to, you need to annotate data. Data quality is, is key. Um, 
sometimes you can go with a not that great product in the market and kind of iterate and make it better. So basically already provide some value and then use the user feedback to be smart about what you annotate. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big part. And then the other thing is also you can work with simulations um, in some space. I mean, when you're very good at simulating the real world, you can basically generate data or train your system in simulation that way, um, kind of circumvent the whole problem of, of dealing with real world data. I think I have a good example from our portfolio, a company called Zeitgold, they automate accounting for small uh, businesses and that's a space, uh, this accounting space where you would not go to because you basically don't get the data instantly. So what they did is they started with an app and they automated everything to the merchant and then in the background they were doing everything manually and then step by step they were automating through machine learning and other applications but they through that, they generated data and they annotated the data, which was extremely expensive, so they already raised 25 million euros, um, but that gave them the data set and the understanding of the data set. We have other businesses where, for example, transcription, Verbit from, from Tel Aviv, where then freelancers do it, um, and for Ultimate AI, even the customers doing that for free, uh, luckily. Um, so, so owning that whole process, that's what we like. So when you as a startup can see end-to-end -end what's happening there and you really understand it, and then you can start with a little data, at least as long as you can control it and pay to make it even better or more data. I think um, getting the, the customers to do the work, if, if the business model is or, or the product is, is right, can be really powerful. So we have two companies we work with, uh, we're investors in, who do that, where, where actually the, the machine learning enabled features are not the kind of V1 or, or the, the kind of initial product. So one company is a business called Odin Technologies, which is a kind of manufacturing analytics platform. And the first product they took out to market was really a, a, a kind of data aggregation and visualization platform for factories. So they would go out, they would connect all of the, the machines in the factories by retrofitting them with a, a small IoT device and pull all that data into a visualization platform. And the visualization itself was useful to the factory floor managers and to the, the uh, factory management. Um, but what that allowed Odin to do was get in all of that data to use kind of user labeling of some sort, which was that users were kind of drilling in when there was a problem and, and kind of highlighting those areas and tagging them for their own use to say, oh, I saw there was, a, there was downtime in this time or, or this is when the, the machine was running outside of the right parameters. And then Odin can use that data that the kind of users label to, to kind of train machine learning algorithms that in the end will allow them to provide their more advanced features like um, predictive, um, predictive maintenance and uh, kind of variable optimization of production runs. So that's an example again like that. Another one is a company called Streetbees that at its core is a surveying product. So they go out to, to users with a kind of micro survey type proposition. And again, the, the V1 for their customers who are kind of large FMCG brands is that they get survey data back about users and how they feel about their products. Um, but what street bees do is they'll ask you to take a photograph and write about how you feel about that photograph. So I, I, the, the, one of the questions would be like, what were you eating for, for lunch in a, in a takeaway restaurant? And you'll take a photograph and you'll say, uh, this is a burger and I thought it was juicy and tasty. And suddenly they've got really deep labeling of that image that they can then start to train algorithms on. Um, and, and also to do things like user segmentation, which is a kind of big ask of their customers. So again, it's like user labeling and, and user inputted data that in, in V2 of the product or in the, in the advanced features that they can then charge their customers more for, then they can unlock those machine learning use cases. Any more questions? We still have a bit of time, else I would have one. Okay. The way we talk about OI on this conference, it always appears to me like a closed shop. Like there's this nice, tiny, forward-thinking AI world and everything else is old business. Do you really make, in terms of investment, in terms of what you're considering an AI company, this, this clear, clear cut? What is an AI-driven business, which is just, just a software or a data analysis-driven business? Or just a business which, which is not producing goods because in reality, with clients who really want to implement something, I find this distinction very hard to make. I mean, is it AI the moment they have a TensorFlow or the moment they use Google Maps? Or does this distinction even make any, uh, does it even matter at all in, in real life applications? I, mean, I, I think that in, in, most, I mean, in most applied use cases of solving big commercial problems, AI is now a tool, part of a tech stack. It's like saying I only invested in businesses using the internet 10 years ago or I invested in businesses using the cloud five years ago. Now, for a lot of businesses, it's a component. And I think that um, 
like in the two examples I just gave, it, it isn't even the core of the, the kind of first version of the product. Now, there are some businesses like uh, the, the health business of Marantex, which is built in it at its core and wouldn't exist without these technologies. And there are some businesses that are kind of vertical AI, sorry, horizontal AI or kind of enabling infrastructure AI that are AI businesses like a, a chip or a, a hosted infrastructure or something else. But I think the point is right. I think as we look to, to the kind of applied side, we stop needing, we, at some point we stop talking about AI conferences and it just becomes a core part of, of most people's tech stack. And um, as, as these technologies get more and more accessible, as you have to do kind of less and less of the R&D work yourself in-house to use them, I think that that distinction pretty quickly kind of blurs. I think the right term is we, we would invest in, in data science driven companies, mm. uh, which apply machine learning, but also other techniques around data science that enable something. But we don't care if it's called an AI company. And I actually recommend when we do fundraising for larger rounds for the companies not to put that on the slide if they're not doing it, because people will challenge you. Uh, I, can, I can assure you Ben really understands what AI is and what is not, so don't put it on the slide if you don't do it. Um, and, and that holds, uh, is true for, for most of the investors out there. So at the end of the day, it's, it's unlocking crazy new things, great new things for us. Um, but for us, more the, the problem and the solution of the problem, what you're actually unlocking is more important than what you do there. And I guess for Merantix, uh, you know, just don't throw uh, algorithms at something and see what comes out of it. Yeah, no, but I mean, for us, it's also important, like, is this, like, a business problem, right? Like, is there, is there actually a business case, and that, that should come first, um, um, because otherwise it's, it's more academic research. Yeah. I think, I mean, one of the things we were talking about last week was there are lots of companies now, I, I kind of use the term advanced analytics, it's kind of the same as data science, I guess, yeah. but, like, there are lots of companies who are using non-deep learning approaches that, depending on how far you stretch your def definition of AI, are still AI, um, yeah. Or they're using a combination. So we're, we're um, working closely with a company now who do large-scale simulation, and that's kind of the, the core of their product. But then there are components of machine learning that kind of get followed into that to improve efficiency or, or kind of increase accuracy of results. And so I think we're seeing, again, coming back to this, this previous point, machine learning techniques go into this kind of broader tech stack with other advanced techniques as well and can, can again, kind of supercharge or, or kind of refine things. But it's... In, it's still only one technology, and I think if you're not if you're building a company without using it, that's that's not a bad thing, right? There, there are lots of other technical approaches that can be kind of equally as effective, and sometimes the right solution is a is a simple kind of rule based rule based system, and it may be a slightly kind of lower tech moat, but I also think there's a, there's a growing view that kind of data moats and and tech. Data modes, particularly as a, as a kind of defensibility when you're building a machine learning business, are are not a kind of long-term sustainable thing. Anyway, I don't know if, if yeah, no, I don't think, think I don't I don't think like having large static data sets is a huge uh, competitive advantage. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a competitive advantage in the beginning, but like not in the long term. It gives you basically a head start, and the same, yeah. um, you know, being being strong on machine learning, um, you know, helps you to quicker build the, the 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 products. But like algorithm itself, I mean, everything is published. It's going to get commoditized. I think. Um, the harder part is like integrating that robustly into some workflow. And I think that's the difference now with kind of all these AI companies. That's many of them are in workflows which were completely human before and very tedious, or where not even anyone could basically leverage that data. And I think that that is basically creating a lot of value that you suddenly have like kind of quite high skilled labor which now could focus on something else. All right. Last chance for the last question. Please in the back. Hi, I'm Fan from Endet Capital. Um, as VC world, we always look at company uh, or evaluate the business according to financial KPIs and marketing KPIs. That's according to like normal business models or the business that's not in AI world. And I'm wondering now with the AI coming in and with AI specific businesses, is there some specific KPIs related to it that I can use to evaluate uh, performance of an AI company? I think we use proxies. I mean, 
I, I, I don't understand how an F1 score works or how I measure precision and recall really as a VC. I mean, I understand it mathematically, but I, I guess I need a lot of benchmarks. What we're really looking for is uh, what is the outcome, what is the result? So, for example, faster onboarding time, uh, more precise uh, questions or answers that are matched, so happy customers. Um, and sometimes you can even see that with MVPs, so first indications, that, that it really makes sense to use uh, machine learning or whatsoever. Um, but the, the scores themselves, we do, we do our, um, our due diligence with our CTOs from our portfolio, and they basically challenge then the data scientists if they do proper work. Yeah, I think it's, it's always just basically, like you should always look at the actual business value, and it's very different in, in different applications. So depending on how basically you integrate machine learning into some workflow, um, for some cases you need to be like super precise, like if you do, I don't know, like quantitative trading, like whenever you trade, you want to be right, because uh, otherwise you're going to lose a ton of money. For other use cases, um, if it's more kind of a supporting tool for people and people accept mistakes, uh, for example, I don't know, if you want to find uh, compliance issues in uh, large amounts of data of corporates, like you can, even if you just, if you, even if you just provide like 100 cases, of which then only 10 are in the end like very, very big problems, that is all you already huge value add. And so in the end, I think you always should just look at it like any other business, like what is the actual business value it's driving. And then more interesting will be then like how, how can that improve over time? That's maybe like a bit more kind of the AI part. Like if you now get a 1,000, 10,000, whatever amounts of customers um, and collect more data, can you improve in that way, um, make it harder for other competitors to come in or are you basically very much plateauing somewhere? Ben, you got the final words. How do we get your money? Uh, that was <laughs> How do I? <laughs> um, well, I mean, what I was going to say to answer that question, I'll kind of roll it into that. I think it also depends very much on the stage that you're investing as a, as a, anyway. I think if you're saying the same thing in a different way, if you're investing in a company when it's or, that's using AI, but when it's already got $50 million of revenue, then clearly you're just investing, or you, the, the, the AI use case is kind of proven. If you're investing when it's two people and an idea, then you've got to be investing in those people and their kind of technical credibility. And at different points in between, that kind of, um, th those milestones look different. So for us, if we're investing in a very technical business pre-launch, we're looking to see the kind of technical part de-risked with a view that um, that's a key milestone that kind of Im that drives value in the business and that we can support on the commercialization. Or if you're investing one step further, you want to see the kind of early customer proof point. So I think, it, to, to try and answer Jasper's question then, um, I think at each point in, in your business, when you're, if you're going out to raise money um, and you're using these technologies, you have to kind of be aware yourself of where you are on that journey. And so what is the, what is the most recent thing that you've achieved that is a kind of valuation or a kind of value kind of milestone for your business? Is it a big technical de-risking? Is it an initial commercial de-risking? Is it a scale-up de-risking? And what's the next one you're heading towards? And that really helps you to kind of pitch where you are and where you're going, and that helps me to be very clear about kind of where the value is and, and what needs to happen to kind of uh, to see that next stage of growth and, and value. Great. So we already had the question about uh, Asia. Next, coming up in five minutes, so we do a little break, um, is the future of AI in Asia. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you to the audience as well. Thanks. And thank you.